director recital during this pandemic. Um, I would like to let you know that this lecture recital will be no intermission. I'm going to present and uh, analyze the piece, and then I'm going to perform, and analyze the second piece and perform. So that means no break. I would like to start the lecture with playing some music of the composer. While I play the piece with my amazing violist, Heejin, can you guess who might be the composer? So, Heejin, could you? to three periods, early, middle, and late. And I'm going to introduce three piano solo works that best represent each period. So let me briefly introduce his life. George Rockford was born on July 5th, 1918 in New Jersey. He was first exposed to music through his brother's violin lesson. And Robert was a teenager when he first developed an interest in jazz. In 1935, Robert entered a Montclair State Teachers College where he sang high baritone. After graduating uh, from Montclair State Teachers College, Robert entered at the Venice, Co Co uh, Venice College of Music. And there, he met his wife, uh, Jean Rosenfield. But the year after they got married, the United States entered the World War II. And then Robert was drafted into the army. Because of some injuries, Robert returned to the United States. And then he resumed his musical studies at Curtis. Then he went on to complete a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1950, Robert had a chance to stay in Rome for a year. There he met Luigi Dalla Piccola, who was an Italian serialist composer, and he ended up a very influential figure on Robert, especially for uh, um, lyricism, lyrical serialism. After this, 
Robert became a serial composer for a decade. When he came back from Rome, he ended up working as an editor at Theodore Presser Company. After resigning from his post at the Theodore Presser Company in 1960, Robert became the acting chair of the University of Pennsylvania. And this appointment boosted his international reputation as he became colleagues alongside fellow composers, including George Crumb and Leonard Mayer. In 1961, Robert's 17-year-old son, 17-year-old son, Paul, died um, because of the brain tumor. Because of this tragic event, Robert concluded that serial music did not have the emotional capability to express his sorrow. In an interview with Robert Riley, he recalled, Actually, by 1961, I was already experiencing very serious doubts about this thing called 12 tone. And I am beginning to think that there is something wrong here. The trauma in Rockberg's personal life gave him an occasion to reflect on music expressive potential. And Rockberg began to search for a musical language better suited to his creative and expressive needs. Rockberg found what he was looking for in music of the past. He used the technique of musical quotation or the recycling of pre-existing music as a raw material for his original creation. In 1971, Rockberg confirmed his move away from serialism. Rockberg's new music provoked a harsh criticism from his former colleagues. However, Rockwork's music from 1970 and 80s enjoyed widespread popularity among the performers and audiences. For example, his violin concerto was performed 47 times between 1975 and 1977 after his initial performance by Isaac Stern. Rockwork also exercised an influence music theory through his books and publication in numerous music journals. His best known books include Five Lines and Four Spaces and The Aesthetic of Survival. Rockberg's stylistic evolution can be summarized as follows an early style, which naturally includes his formal education, um, and features creative works that explore neoclassicism and atonality. A middle style, which was deeply serialist and continued until 1963, and a late style, which can be largely characterized as neo-romanticism. Today, I'm going to talk about three solo piano works in particular. I chose one from each of three periods. Two Prelude and Fugetta in D minor, Sonata Fantasia for middle period, and Carl Newberg music for late period. First, in George Rockberg's early period, he was exposed to a variety of musical genres at an early age. He performed as a jazz pianist while Rockberg was in New York. Performing jazz in club was also a way for him to earn a living and pay for his tuition. As I mentioned earlier, he was drafted into the army and Rockberg's wartime experience especially the participation of the Normandy landings, profoundly affected his art and his worldview. The composer recalled, the war years were much more than an interruption in my musical studies. They taught me what art really meant because I learned what life really meant. The war shaped my psyche and internal development. In fact, before World War II, Rockberg's work were mostly tonal. However, the war altered his philosophy and sense of morality. It drew him toward the atonal music. He stated, after the war, after I began to feel, I had my feet on the ground musically, 
and in other ways too, the drama, the darkness of what whole experience. And that's what started to push me into a kind of atonal world. 1955 is considered the end of the Rockbrook's early period. Solo piano works from this period include a ballad, book of contrapuntal pieces, variations on original theme, two preludes and fugetta, which I'm going to represent, sonata number one, sonata seria, and sonata number two. Prelude and Fugetta in D minor shows his early period characteristic very well. Rockworks composed this work in 1946 while he was studying at Venice. As the title suggests, Rockbrook had been studying Joyce Bach Walton per Clavier. In the prelude, it shows all the features of Baroque music. Some of these include uh, imitation, repetition of motif, and pedal point. However, it was not enough for Rockberg to just simply uh, imitate and study Baroque compositional technique. He went beyond the boundaries of the Baroque era. So in terms of indication and time signature, it passed in 5-4 time and marked not just low, but very expressive. By using English, not the traditional Italian, this is a classical example of 20th century music vocabulary. So here's the opening of the prelude. In the opening three, uh, there is a three phrases of the prelude. And each phrase introduces a nine different pitches. So if I play the very beginning of the prelude, from other 
composer. Another interesting feature is Rockwork's way of coloring the harmony with the Neapolitan sixth chord before the cadence. So I'll play the very end of the forget. Thank you. 
the middle period. Um, Rockford first encountered the Schoenberg's 12-tone system through his teacher, Adolf Weiss, and Weiss was a pupil of Schoenberg. I think it might be interesting to mention this, that Rockford was not the only important American comp composer uh, who has been studying with Adolf Weiss. Surprisingly enough, so was John Cage, who was very different from Rockford. So anyway, Rockford recalled his studies as follows. I had begun to study Schoenberg with considerable intensity around 1947, and it was from the very beginning of love-hate relationship. It did not matter to me whether I liked it or not. I had to find out what was there, why it was there, and how it was made. In 1950, Robert was a recipient of American Academy Prize who allowed him to live in Rome for a year. So there he met Luigi Dalla Piccola, whose serial music deeply influenced Rockford's style. So let us hear a short excerpt of Dalla Piccola's variation for orchestra. So as you can listen to this piece, even though it is serial, it is still singable. This lyrical serialism highly influenced Rockford. In 1952, he began a decade of composing using serial technique. This year period saw the creation of four piano solo works. 12 Bagatelle for Piano, which is a Rockford's first entirely 12-tone piece, Arioso, Sonata Fantasia, and Barcatonia. Above all, Robert articulated the importance of lyricism. In an interview with Robert Riley, he said, I am a natural singer. My 12 tone music also sings in a way that no American uh, 12 tone music sings. So, Robert's commitment to songful writing unites the music from all three periods. His lifelong lyricism is central to understanding him as a man and as a composer. So I would like to repeat that again. His lifelong lyricism is central to understand him as a man and as a composer. So let us examine the Sonata Fantasia, which represents the piano work from his middle period. Written in 1955, it was premiered by Howard Lubo at the Junior School. Rockford considered this composition one of only three works dedicated to his wife to be among his best. Rockford himself admitted that the influence of Charles Ive Concord Sonata and Stefan Ulf Pizzicalia. Above all, these reflect a clear demonstration of Schoenberg's serial technique. He quotes a passage from Schoenberg's Five Klaverstück, Opus 23, number one. The Sonata Fantasia is a serial work that consists of three large movements that are connected by prologue and two interludes and epilogue. Interestingly, the work, the three large movements, do not share any melodic or rhythmic motifs. However, the prologue, interludes, two interludes, and um, epilogue do share a common musical ideas. As the title suggests, these eight tone piece engage two distinctive genres, the sonata and the fantasy, both of which emerge and developed from the traditional tonal music. And I will focus on the prelude, prologue, and the first movement in this lecture. Since it's 12 tone music, the basic role of this piece can be divided into four subsets, and each consisting three consecutive notes. 
The first subset is And the second subset Third one These chromatic subsets uh, present very dissonant sonorities. So this is how Rothberg used the row in the beginning of the sonata fantasia. And meanwhile, the notes that are not highlighted also makes a use of serial units, only transposed. The first movement is through composed and feature improvisatory passage. Here's the important feature. Schoenberg's five quadrature opus 23 number one is quoted directly. Transposed onto three staves, borrowing of musical material from other composer is the uh, characteristic from, uh, of a late period compositions. Just as we saw the idea of Fugetta, he quotes a uh, well-tempered Claudio Fugue. It already shows his borrowing of technique in his earlier period too. Not only did Rothberg quote the material from Schoenberg, but he also used the rhetorical lament gesture he frequently employed in this uh, Baroque era. So this is specifically illustrated by the uh, chromatic descending line. So in, the, in Baroque era, this descending second is considered as a lament gesture. It sounds like And Rothberg illustrated like this. Interestingly, the same year he wrote a sonata fantasia, he published his theory book called The Hexachord and its Relation to the Twelve Tone Row. Ironically, the use of tone row in the Sonata Fantasia proves much freer in comparison in earlier work, to his earlier works. In fact, he recalled, there is no row. It is clear that Rockbrook developed his, his own way of composing twelve tone work. So in this respect, Rothberg's early 12-tone music is very strict, whereas the later works shows flexibility. He sought to create original music, serial, uh, original serial music, with emphasis on expression and emotion. Furthermore, Rothberg did not abandon the traditional elements. In the case of Sonata Fantasia, he employs the traditional three movement form, cyclical form, and uses two genres, sonatas and fantasy. I'm going to present the first two sections of a sonata fantasia, and it will take uh, 10 minutes or so.
Romper became very famous for his serial music, he felt compelled to search for a new method of music, writing music. He said, I couldn't breathe anymore. I needed air. I was tired of the same round of manipulating the pitches vertically and horizontally. It wasn't so much that the scale were out of running. Our pitches were out of running. Octave passages were out of running. There is everything artificial about it. But there is a transition of period before Rockberg moved completely towards tonality. There are three aspects that highly influence Rockberg's late musical style. First, the influence of Charles Ives. Second, the visual arts. And third, of course, the death of his son. While looking for an answer, for a departure from serialism, Rockberg found inspiration in the music of Charles Ives. Ives' music, musical style, is quoting music from very diverse genres. These genres range from the classical to popular music, band music, folk songs, or hymn in a single composition. Let us hear a short passage of second movement of three places in New England by Ives. this kind of style, um, and he started to merge a collage technique and a use of past music into his own musical language. Second, the visual arts influenced Rockberg. He was especially drawn to Cubist artists, a way of synthesizing a multiple perspective on a single subject, a single object and used the collage technique to achieve a similar effect in his music. Rockberg's new aesthetic was also embodied in his concept of multiple gesture, which accounts for the generative structure of his slave period. Rockberg's approach to musical quotation was to borrow a portion of an existing melody and rhythm and then reconstruct or modify the music, often combine the material from multiple composers in a single work, and this technique called multiple gesture. Most importantly, the loss of his son profoundly altered Robert's approach to music. He first stopped composing because of an inability to express his grief through serial music. Robert recalled, after Paul died, that absolutely made it necessary for me to wash my hands of the whole thing, which is serialism. The composer confessed, it has taken me all this year to recognize and embrace the fact that I am a root. I am a complete romantic, and especially now the question arises on all sides. After the abstraction, what's next? The answer rings out clearly, the new romanticism. Thus, Rockberg reinvented his musical language after 1965, turning from serialism back to tonality. His representative works from this neo-romantic period include Magic, no, Music for the Magic Theater, Symphony No. 3, Imago Mundi, String Quartet No. 3, and Quintet for Piano and String Quartet. Here, for example, a short passage for music for the magic theater.
I'm sorry to stop it. If you have time, please listen to the whole thing. It is very, very beautiful. Rockbox solo piano works from this period are knockback, carnival music, and partita variation, and four short sonatas, and three three pieces. So in this respect, Rockbox music evidence considerable influence from the variety sources. Composer like Charles Ives, as well as the visual art and his personal life event. Carnival music is a multi movement composition for a solo piano and is representative of Brockberg's late period. Could you please check the sound? Sound is on. Anyway, carnival music is a multi movement composition for solo piano and is representative of Rockbrook's late period. Written in 70, 1971, the work was dedicated to Gerald Blumenthal, who was my teacher at Julia. It consists of five contrasting movements. Fanfare and March, Blues, Largo Doloroso, Sufumato, and Toccata Rec. Before I go on to the work analysis, I would like to talk about the motif that Rockwork uses throughout this work. This work is based on Bach motif, and he mentioned that the Bach Sinfonia does indeed form the foundation of carnival music. So you can see the red box on the right side. If I remove the repeated note of A flat, and then goes down to F sharp. The four note motif reveals an interesting connection to the famous B A C H Bach musical letter. The Bach musical letter is. If I change the order of to. That will be the same Bach musical letter in transposed way. And another possible configuration of this motif is in the blue box is ascending semitone. At times, Rockberg uses this chromatic ascending line to create dissonant chord. Okay, let's move on to the first movement. The first movement, Fanfare is in March, consists of three main sections, Fanfare, March, and Coda. Rockford combines this eight-tonal Fanfare and tonal March into the same movement, which exemplifies his term, multiple gesture. In terms of Bach motif, it may be found, it may be found in measure six, the red box. So F he displays the uh, register of the pitches, but the actual sounds like March section clearly demonstrates the influence 
of American pop song. The legend of Sinatra figure, A flat, E flat, E flat, this fragment suggests a strong tonic and dominant relationship in the key of A flat major. And also the chromatic arrangement of the Bach motif, here, the circle, appears in the right hand simultaneously. So it sounds like Before I move on to the next movement, I'd like to point out one more thing where the march section ends. The chord consists of G dominant in the left hand, whereas in the right hand it has with the A sharp, which is in harmony with B flat. And yes, it can be reasonably interpreted, interpreted harmonically on paper. It offers orally to the listener simply a dissonant chord. And it connects, it, this role of this chord is very important because it connects the atonal fanfare section to the atonal, I mean, to the tonal march section. So atonal fanfare section to tonal march section. Second, the title of this movement already suggests the direct reference to the blues genre and it's believed that to be a nostalgic reflection of Roberts' own jazz experience. Blues can be either be divided into seven parts or it can be defined as a theme, five variation, and a coda. And I will point out how Robert varies the Bach theme on every variation. Oh, it is very interesting to see it. The theme consists of quasi improvisatory without any bar lines or time signature. And the Bach motif appears in the upper voice. Here, in the upper voice. Above the bass. motif appears again with B flat in the left hand's upper voice this time. Introduces clearly this variation. 
However, the minor second imbalance interval is used here in order to show the transformative nature of the Bhagavati. By presenting the minor second interval as a grace note, Rockbrook hints the double meaning. Not only is the interval as embellishment itself, but the grace note serves as an expressive tool for the blues. Therefore, the last movement 
plays an important role by organically synthesizing all five movements. To summarize, Rockberg's carnival music clearly evidences the composer's neo-romantic manner. The juxtaposition of the tonality and atonality within a single movement serves to regulate the musical tension of the work. And he successfully illustrates the aesthetic by combining the old and new. The old forms and genres such as the kara and theme and variation versus the new. The distinct harmony and rhythmic elements of a ragtime and blues. Most notably, the technique of quotation played an important role in this work. Frequent quotation of of her symphonia and Brahms affirm his embracement of tradition into his own language. In this way, cardinal music is highly emblematic of the Rockbrook's late period. So now I'm going to perform the complete uh, cardinal music. Before I start performing, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming <laughs> during this pandemic. And um, I would like to thank Dr. Green, who was my advisor. Without him, I would, I would not be able to do this lecture. I would not be able to do thesis, of course. So thank you for your time and your effort. And also my beloved teacher, uh, Professor Kaylin, and Dr. Langford, who always advising me and gu guiding me in so many ways. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my long lecture, and here's the uh, cardinal music. The total length will be 27 minutes.